to the group. <laughs> yeah, recording expert, that's me. Take it away, <laughs> McLean. Um, good morning, everyone. This is McLean Warren with Rise and Shine. I am here with my two co-hosts, um, Brendan Fields with Rebate and Dan Trumbull with Dan Trumbull Consulting. How is everyone doing today? Good. You look pumped, Brandon. You just like have this thing. I think you need one of those energy drinks that Isabella was drinking on the yeah. show yesterday. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was up all night last night. We have this old cat and she just meows and meows and I don't know, it's just killing me. She's like <laughs> she's nocturnal, so I'm like kind of like uh, glazy eyed today, but it's all right. <laughs> I have a cat that does that too. He'll just like just whine all night. And I'm like, what? what do you want? I don't know what you want from me. <laughs> yeah, I think they're nocturnal. Is that, that's probably why, right? They, they really are. are. Yeah. Are they orange like, hair? I feel like the orange haired cats are always the ones that are just very vocal. Are they? It could be. Why ginger not? cats. Yeah. Hashtag gingercats.com or whatever. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, it's always the gingers that get in trouble the most, right? <laughs> seems that way. Seems that way. <laughs> anyway, um, let me introduce our guest, Danielle. Um, would you like to kind of give a synopsis of yourself and your background? So I'm Danielle Trogdon. I'm the principal attorney of the Trogdon Law Firm. Um, I actually just opened my firm <clears throat> in February of this year. Um, had no idea that the pandemic would hit as hard as it did. Um, before that, I was at a intellectual boutique law firm, and so did all trademarks, trademark prosecution, um, that worked there. Prior to that, I was at a mid-sized law firm doing uh, corporate and business law. And currently, I work, yeah, so go ahead, sorry. No, 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 you're fine. I didn't interrupt. Um, I was just going to say, you said you have been in the e-commerce business for about two years, you said? Correct. And how did you make that transition from doing like corporate business stuff to specifically focusing on e-commerce? So from the firm that I was at, so the mid-sized firm, I was actually approached by one of my friends to go over and work at that trademark firm. Um, and so that's what I kind of made that jump from. Not, a, it was a jump. <laughs> And so that was, what, and it was just one of those, it was a good fit. I liked working with the clients that I was working with there. Um, most of them were e-commerce, so online businesses in a variety of aspects. And that's what I've continued to do since moving out on my own. Did, did you have to like relearn a bunch of stuff? Is that, you know, when you, is, is it, I guess my question is, is brick and mortar the laws around, you know, corporate life with, you know, real brick and mortars. Is that very different from when you go into e-commerce like Amazon and Etsy and stuff like that and you have to know the law surrounding those platforms? So there is a bit of a loop curve, but I wouldn't say it was that steep because a lot of the businesses that are already brick and mortar are already online in some aspect. And so a lot of that kind of transferred over. The big thing um, of that learning process was primarily um, how they process payments, how they accept payments, and then also they um, receive their goods coming in. So brick and mortar, usually it's kind of that um, standard shipping process, really where when I work with the e-commerce sellers, a lot of times, you know, there's more of importation aspect where they're trying to figure that it's out. It's 11 o'clock. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Um, right. The biggest that part of that. <laughs> right. I thought I I it <laughs> and well, it, so that's kind of the biggest part of the big transition was, um, you know, the brick and mortar is kind of the same, but with e-commerce, you're looking at kind of that broader picture and looking at how the national laws apply more than just the state laws. Hey, Danielle. So in thinking about the differences between brick and mortar and uh, virtual companies, uh, things like the Wayfair, Wayfair.com versus South Dakota judgment a couple of years ago that speaks specifically to sales tax collection and Nexus inventory. Do you find that applies a lot more to e-com companies or pretty much the same? So it, I would say it applies more to e companies, at least from what I've seen, especially with the tax collection um, and where 
businesses are deciding where they want to register their company. And that's where I'm seeing the biggest change come from, from that. So before we were seeing a lot of brick and mortar locations, just choosing to register within their state where e-commerce, they kind of add more implications than just Delaware's protections. They're looking at, you know, those tax implications, filing implications, all of that as well. Awesome. Thanks for that. I have to imagine from a from a legal side, like the um, landscape is cha changing so quickly. I, I imagine as an attorney, it's probably even hard for you to keep up with because um, to Dan's point from a moment ago, that lawsuit changed everything for e-commerce sellers. And like everybody was struggling to, and I think still to today is struggling to comply with that law and figure out what the ramifications are for them. So I would think, and, and maybe you could speak to, you know, how it changed the landscape of, of your business. So that was actually before my time when I went into it. So I didn't um, have to really deal with the transition. I never onboarded after that end um, and with understanding that part of it. So I didn't really have to deal with so much of working transit, but being able to with others um, and a lot of come to me like, I go. I've heard that Wyoming is the best. And then, okay, well, let's actually figure out, you know, what kind of, because that's a big part of the taxes and the sales tax. Um, but not only that, kind of your annual filings. And so that was looking at which states have those. And so that's what my big part when I was working with sellers going through that transition period. Well, sometimes now when they come to me and they're like, hey, what happened? Why do I have this tax bill? Um, well, <laughs> Were you collecting it? How were your records? Um, and look at the state that you're registered in. And then also some states now, especially I've seen, you know, California, New York, they're looking at where that consumer is located, trying to help um, sellers kind of figure it out. And so sometimes we're getting seen that double taxation where sellers are charging one, the state where the consumer is charging another, and sellers aren't keeping the right records to when they need to do their quarterly filings to see if they're actually in compliance or not. So it's really looking at where the consumer is located and now where the seller is located. I will say that on the Amazon platform specifically over the last two years, as states have changed the verbiage in their laws in regard to Nexus sales tax collection, uh, Amazon has fallen in line and started calculating, collecting, and remitting on behalf of third-party sellers in the vast majority of states now. And isn't that, so that is a marketplace facilitator law, right? So that um, makes it a lot easier. And, and um, Danielle, I, I don't know how much experience you have with that, but um, I know at least here in Connecticut where I am, they moved to marketplace facilitator and it made it so much easier. But at the same time, and you probably had this, California has been after me for years trying to collect 10 years of taxes for, because I had like, at one point I had a negligible number of units, like a dozen units of a product at a fulfillment center in California and that established Nexus and they've been trying to collect taxes for years of sales and they've stopped bothering me for now, but like it is a threat to my business for sure because it's gonna be a giant tax bill. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's interesting how that all kind of came to a head in the last last few years. Well, Brendan, if you get in hot water, I know a good attorney you can call, right, Danielle? <laughs> well, I don't yeah. do tax law, but oh, I will definitely wah, work with wah, you. Wah. I know, but it is. It's because so there's a joke that most of our law books were about this thick. Um, and then you have your tax book, which was about this thick. Yeah, for sure. Um, that never gets updated they just add to it they don't update previous codes they just continue adding to it so. of course so if taxes isn't really what you specialize in why don't you tell the audience what you specifically do or what the majority of the work that comes in is like what your clients are after I can't talk with regards to your services. Yeah, so it's the intellectual property protection. So I do trademarks, copyrights, and trade secrets, um, and all aspects of those, as well as corporate and business structures. So LLC, um, corporation, S corp, um, those types of documents. I do um, employment work. So I work with um, 
those documents for employees, so employment agreements, non-disclosure agreements, non-compete agreements. So kind of that corporate transactional side of it. So prior to us recording, you had talked about the importance of copywriting and trademarking with, um, with regards to hijackers and um, a lot of the issues of suspension. Can you speak a little bit more broadly about, or not broadly, more specifically about what you encourage people to do and how that helps them with regards to hijackers coming onto their platform and taking over their business essentially? Yes. So with trademarks and copyrights, so there's, um, I usually tell clients as soon as they start their branding process to apply for the process of their trademark. And then once they have their original work of authorship, so some form, if it can be copyrighted to go through the copyright process. Um, so once you go through that process at the end of it, if you do get registration, um, you can actually submit your registration to a government program called Stop Fakes, um, which helps prevent, so that's through the United States Customs and Borders, and it actually helps prevent some of those infringing goods from coming in, um, but it also gives you kind of that protection. So if you do have somebody that goes online um, and they're alleging that you are infringing on their intellectual property, so with Amazon, it's all of those places they have that policy where you can go, hey, this person is infringing. Um, and they're, you know, all they do is submit that and then you're in the seller dispute or one of the sellers there is, you know, all they did, they changed a vowel around, they changed something where it kind of gives the same commercial impression. It's the same way that you enunciate it out loud. It just has that one vowel change. And so now that infringer, is basically able to take over that account if they didn't have those protections in place. So once you have that trademark registered in place, you've already presented to the government that I'm the owner of this mark. It's alleged that, you know, under penalty of perjury, essentially, that I'm the true owner and this is when I started using the mark, um, where the infringer can have to prove otherwise, that they own this mark before you, that they were using this before you. And so basically it kind of gives you that presumption of being able to go back to Amazon, whoever might have your account based off of that initial, hey, they're do not my intellectual property. It kind of gives you that ability to go back, which is what I do with a lot of clients. If they have those protections, it's really easy to send it in that says, hey, nope, we're all already the registered owner. Here's the proof that they're actually infringing and trying to take over my brand. Um, if you don't have that, it becomes that uphill battle of you're trying to now um, kind of do a tit for tat, essentially. He said, she said, trying to argue something. And if that answered your question, if not, then I can uh, try to clarify. There are follow-up questions to that. Um, but if your infringer is, and I mean, we all hate to say it, but it's true, it's usually in China, how do the international laws apply in regards to stuff like infringement? Like, you know, you have these systems in place that hopefully keep them from making these claims or taking over your company, but how much can you really do to stop them from continuing to do it? So it's a hard one when it comes to international. So if they're overseas, um, there's certain treaties, depending on what country it's from, there are certain treaties that they have to follow. Um, and sometimes it just becomes impossible. <clears throat> so we have to allow or not allow, um, but rely on essentially our government's help um, as well as the e-commerce platform. And at least the ones that I worked with before, once we have kind of that registration and that proof to be able to present to them and show that this as essentially is over, um, that kind of helps. And there's actually been a strong push with the intellectual property community, especially with the United States Trademark Office, where they're actually requiring foreign applications. They have to have a United States attorney working with them, um, or they have to be domiciled in the United States. Well, of course, they've come up with ways to try and overcome that. Um, and so now you can't have a PO box on a trademark application. You can't have a UPS address. You actually have to have um, a physical address. And um, so there we're trying, there's ways, um, but really it's kind of relying on those e-commerce platforms 
um, to do their part in trying to get it. Um, otherwise, it's really trying out with those international treaties. Um, and sometimes some governments, and I hate to say it, China is one of those governments, um, it's easy for sellers to come in um, and infringe on those goods that are from China. So is there any way, so you're using, you're filing this with CBP, so Customs and Border Protection. Is there any way to use them as a gatekeeper to try to stop this stuff from even getting into the U.S.? Like, I know they only inspect a small percentage of containers, and even if they do, they may not be aware of a trademark infringing product in that container. But like, as a seller, you would at least hope that you would have some early line of defense against the stuff even getting in the U.S. before you rely on Amazon, which is notoriously difficult to deal with, to get them to fix your problem. Like, in a perfect world, they would catch at the border and say, this, you know, violates, uh, you know, this trademark or this patent and turn it around. I'm sure in real life that doesn't happen too often, but. No, I do think the Stop is Fakes program, um, which is where the Borders program, um, you have to submit your registration to them. So some people miss that step. They think it automatically goes. Um, the government doesn't talk to each other. Um, so one branch isn't talking to the next one. So you actually have to submit your registration. And if you have an inkling, so if you see something start coming up online, which goes to policing your intellectual property, so actually making sure that you're doing those searches to see is somebody out there trying to infringe, um, you can alert them. So they have that program. And I think, at least from my experience, it's been limited. Um, you know, I'm not constantly calling them every day, but they, at least, you know, they take it seriously because they understand, especially under our administration. Who knows what's going to happen in January, but at least under our current administration, they have been pretty strict with that. Um, but you have to alert them, otherwise they don't know to watch for it. Yeah. They're limited in their capacity, too. Yeah, interesting. Any more, you would pretty much tell most sellers, if not all sellers, that they really should be brand registered if they're going to sell specifically on Amazon. Yeah, especially Amazon um, and a lot of sellers that are already going to Amazon usually end up wanting to get Amazon brand registered. Um, and I also think it gives, you know, that your reputation, um, at least as a consumer, um, when I'm looking at Amazon, if I see that registered symbol or that copyright symbol, something, it gives me, oh, this has more authority. Like this is an actual legitimate product um, versus if I don't see that. So I think just your reputation and authority, it just helps um, in a business sense to have that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I don't think it's any secret that brand registry not only offers all those things you just mentioned, Danielle, but there's also a, it opens us a, a whole suite of other marketing options, which we've talked about on previous episodes. There's also an aesthetic uh, side of it where you can build big, beautiful listings with embedded images and videos. And uh, it really does just open up a whole suite of, um, of things that you can better portray your product. And, and to speak to your point, uh, it really does lend credibility all around. Yeah. Consumer confidence, so I, guess, one of things, I would say. Yeah. Um, one of the things we had talked about before recording as well is we were talking about being um, on the proactive side of the legal issues as opposed to being on the defense after it happens. So you had talked a little bit about what measures you can take um, to ensure that, I mean, I guess you kind of already addressed a lot of them but um, what measures you can take to ensure that you are placing your um, store properly? Yeah, so, and when I say policing, it's really um, taking measures. So some attorneys will put you on a watch service where you have a separate company that has your portfolio. Um, so your various brands um, and they pretty much do their automatic algorithm and some of those are fairly expensive other ones are fairly cheap um, if you're on the end of you're wanting to do this yourself it's simply you know conducting a search at least once a week um, on Google on Amazon just typing in one your name 
but also kind of switching up the letters around. So if you're looking at, you know, an E and an I might sound the same at the end of words. So kind of switching up those letters, an S and a C might sound the same. Um, so kind of just switching those around and just doing your Google search and your Amazon search and seeing if this comes up. Um, but then also watching your own brand. Um, sometimes there are some people that miss those red flags where it's, wow, you know, this product I was only selling a couple of every once and now all of a sudden I'm selling that like every single day in multiple batches. Um, so it might have been something that you're selling once a week and it's just kind of been that standard thing and then all of a sudden you're selling 10 a day for two weeks. Well, that should be a sign that you have somebody else out there that's trying to take your product um, and they might be rebranding it into their own name or they might be getting it. I've actually seen... <laughs> Um, kind of so on the trademark office, we kind of laugh at some of the specimens. Those are the pictures of your product that you send. And one of them was actually baby wipes. Um, and they took just their own label and literally laid it over the top of the other label. And you could see through the image that other person's label below it. Um, is that, that what private labeling <laughs> is? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's just those little things that you have to laugh at. Um, but the government allowed that trademark to proceed to wow. registration. Um, and so then, yeah, and so then it's kind of one of those, okay, now you're trying to not only, you know, had you been policing that mark and being like, oh, wow, we saw because all they changed two, two letters around at the beginning of the trademark name. And that was it. Um, and they were very similar letters, so the same um, pronunciation. And so had that person been policing a mark, they could have easily opposed that registration, which is a much more affordable process. Send a cease and desist letter, even more affordable. And most of the time, infringers, once they receive a cease and desist letter, they actually do stop um, because they know that this other person wants to protect their brand and they're going to take it seriously. Yeah, if, if I can just tack on. Since you're talking about things to look out for, things to keep on your radar screen, red flags, another one that I've had multiple times with clients is they ask me the following question. If I own this product and I'm the only seller, why do I own, why do I have the buy box 81% of the time? Now there's a bunch of reasons that can happen. One of them is because somebody was testing and they've sold some units and now they've tested it, it works and they probably have a very large shipment of units coming over from Asia. Uh, but if you're starting to lose the buy box and you haven't done that before, investigating if other people are selling or other people have been on that or keeping a much closer eye on the number of sellers that are on, I say your listing, but they're all Amazon's listings. Legally, you know, they own the listing and we're allowed to use it. Uh, if you have brand registry, then, Maybe maybe other people can't use it. Maybe they can, but it all depends on the IP. But Amazon owns all the listings, uh, so anyone can really come on there unless you've protected yourself. Uh, but losing the buy box a percentage of the time can be an indicator of, hey, someone else is selling this, and that's why you don't have it 100% of the time. To check that, you can simply go into Seller Central, Inventory, Manage Inventory, and click on your specific seller SKU link. And it'll take, to, take you to a beautiful page with a bunch of information, one of which is buy box percentage. Danielle, have you seen any uh, good IP like theft tools? So like, I definitely seen it, maybe Dan, you've seen this, there's software that'll monitor your listing. Because if you have thousands of listings, it's really difficult to stay on top of who, you know, which may have been hijacked, particularly if the hijacker in the scenario you described, Dan, only had one or five or 10 units for a test batch, they might all sell through before you notice. So like, I've never used them, but I know there are tools out there that monitor your listing will give you a real time alert the moment that somebody's selling on your listing. Or if you're a bigger brand, you know, if your brand is being sold on an unauthorized site or can do, you know, more of an internet wide monitoring as well. So I don't know, Danielle, are you familiar with any of those tools? Yeah, so those are, there's a lot of different trademark watch services. That's kind of what they're called. So if you just do like Google um, brand watch services, trademark watch services, and you'll have a bunch of different ones pop up. I don't have any in particular that I recommend because a lot of times it's based off of somebody's price preference. 
Um, I haven't come across any that I would say stay against. Most of them are be decent, um, but it's really kind of what you prefer. But, but yeah, if you go in brand watch, trademark watch, and you can actually hire um, a company and really you're just hiring their, you know, ability to use their software because they have, you know, some program that's able to go um, and can't constantly do that. And you can set it based on your preferences. Like I want this to run every day. I want this to run once a week. Um, you know, I'm really only concerned. Let's just run this once a month kind of thing. I was actually curious for you, Brendan, um, because you own a rebate um, company. Do you guys have systems in place to keep people from buying buying a bunch of inventory for super cheap and then reselling it? Yeah, sorry, my dog's here. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, so, wow, well, the one day I bring them over here. Uh, I want to hear your cat now. <laughs> that'll be the next thing, yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, to, to your question, so yeah, so we do, that's, um, it's somewhat of a problem. Um, you know, we occasionally will find a seller that, um, you know, creates a shopper account, you know, redeems these, these uh, promotions and then goes on to try to resell the product. A lot of times though, it's an interesting thing. We get like false alarms. So we'll have a seller run a promotion on rebate and they'll say, you know, now I see, um, you know, my product for sale on eBay. And what a lot of times it is, is it's actually arbitrage. So what they're doing is the eBay listing, if I don't know, Dan, you've probably seen this and, and McLean as well. Um, your products may be for sale all over eBay and the, per the seller doesn't have them. The moment you buy from them on eBay, you'll see a sale come through on Amazon. So a lot of what sellers perceive is resale by other sellers is actually an arbitrage um, you know, scenario. So. Yeah, to expound on that, um, th there's a there's a a niche, a sub 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 niche of uh, selling online, and that's exactly what it is. People scour Amazon and eBay and Etsy and Wayfair and Sears and Walmart, and the list goes on and on, and they try and find inefficiencies in the marketplace. So, um, and and it was a pretty effective business model back in the day. As a matter of fact, ten years ago, I used to flip. Walmart stuff on Amazon. That is against policy, just for the record now. But people still do it, and people still do it in different and creative ways. And if you have the time or software to spend, you could probably carve out a fair living doing it. But it's a dangerous game. I'd say it's just on Amazon anyway. It's just as dangerous as drop shipping. You just shouldn't do it. It's uh, because, and the reason it's dangerous is because it's hard to meet all the metrics and ship times, delivery times. Um, one of the reasons specifically drop shippers get banned from Amazon is because uh, you're not allowed to buy and ship in from another retailer, which would exclude all the companies that I just mentioned. Uh, so I am familiar with that. I don't recommend it in today's marketplace, but I understand why people try it. Yeah. And as it pertains, you know, to law, it's not really IP theft. It's just, you know, you know, a sales channel outside of the norm, but it's not right about before. Yeah. Right. I think that would technically be covered under like the Sherman and Clayton antitrust acts, which will allow you to resell anything that you buy within, I guess. Right. Is that right? Am mm -hmm. I, I am not a lawyer for the record. <laughs> You just pretty much, yeah. <laughs> There's a little more, but yeah, if you purchase it, you can resell it. You just can't, you know, intentionally um, kind of price gouge. So that's a big thing that comes out of that. But you bet. What we're talking about, yeah. How do they determine, this is a little off topic, but just since you brought up price gouging and maybe you know, well, how do they determine what is considered price gouging and what is reselling? Like, is there a percentage that they go through and they're like, okay, this is illegal because you've increased your margins this much? Or is it just based on the product who's selling it case by case? I, I honestly don't know the answer to that. I'm not sure how um, the formulation works. And uh, I do know it is by product. Um, and also during, if there is kind of an emergency crisis, what type of emergency crisis, 
Um, but I don't know how they do that formulation. I don't right, know like you can't sell bottles of water for $20 to hurricane victims. Or the guy in Canada who was selling hand sanitizer during the pandemic for like, I forget how much he was selling it for, but I know he got arrested for doing that. Um, anyway, I just thought this was an interesting concept to know, what, you know, what is considered gadget and what's not. Because you still can go on Amazon and find hand sanitizer masks for ridiculous prices. And you're like, yeah, what? eBay is the same. <laughs> I love, uh, I don't know if you guys saw, there was a, uh, I think, Wall Street Journal article about how Amazon had kicked off a ton of salaries for price gouging on hand sanitizer. And then in the article, they showed an Amazon listing, you know, sold by and shipped by Amazon. And it was sanitizer for like $100. And it was this little thing of it. So they, their algorithm accidentally was gouging as well, because it was just based on supply and demand. And then Amazon was super embarrassed. They took down their own listing. But um, yeah, no, it definitely goes on. So. A lot of people don't realize Amazon, there's not a guy in a, black, a back room somewhere setting all the prices. It's all yeah. based on what Amazon thinks customers will pay for like type products, history of that product. Uh, you know, so it's, you know, it just, if people are selling sanitizer for 90, 90 or $110, they're going to come in right at that hundred dollar mark to be competitive. And there's and there's there's just no it's just a computer doing it so yeah fun. so getting back to your profession specifically Danielle Sorry. Name, no I, I love this I love the open conversations and where we go um but I'm curious to know what is your favorite part of your job and what's your least favorite part so my favorite part is seeing um, <clears throat> companies grow and watching them kind of fulfill their dreams. So a lot of entrepreneurs, um, I see them, you know, they start as their online business and they kind of move over to their either own storefront. Um, they're able to kind of grow and make it their own. Um, and so that's what I love, especially because I'm now a business owner, but before that, you know, my background is in business. And so just being able to see people accomplish their dreams, um, I absolutely love that. And that's what, when I get that call up and day, that's like, ah, oh, Danielle, you helped me do this. Thank you so much. That's what warms my heart. It's what I hate. So <laughs> it is. Um, what I hate is dealing with, um, people who are just, they're mean and cruel, um, which happens a lot kind of in the IP world because you deal with a lot of just trademark, um, and copyright bullies, people who um, know they take on the little guy because they can either outfund them, they can um, take on, you know, they have the time, the resources, and so they're just going to take um, on the little guys. And I hate seeing that because a lot of times my clients are the little people um, and they just don't have either the resources to be able to take them on um, or if they do have the resources, it's not worth it for them. It's more affordable for them to go on a different path. Um, and I hate seeing that because that for them, it's their dream that just got basically scrunched by the bigger person. Um, and that's what I don't like about it. But it comes. Do you recommend that most businesses that are selling online have a lawyer as like on backup? Like immediately? at all times. <laughs> I do, especially um, even if it's just kind of you have that connection with them because if you find yourself in a situation where you're, you know, face down with a time frame because a lot of times in law you have certain time periods that you have to do with stuff. Um, if your account is suspended, you have certain times you have to do stuff. You just have certain time frames. Um, and if you already have a relationship with that attorney that already knows your business, already knows your goals, already knows, you can pick up that phone. Like, okay, here's our game plan. Here's how we can move forward. Um, if you're then trying to find an attorney during that time period, you know, you're already stressed, you're already worried, um, and you might not find that attorney that you like to work with, the one that understands your business. So having that relationship on the back end is going to save you kind of those resources going forward. Um, and then also having an attorney, they can give you different ideas. Hey, did you think of this? Oh no, do I need that? Um, a lot of times, you know, people, oh, I have this website. Can you please look it over to make sure I have all of these things done? And great thing about attorneys is we also write a lot so we can help identify 
silly typos, but can, you know, help make sure that you're in compliance. So that way you're not facing the government later because you decided to violate some sort of act or, you know, something happens later, you have that relationship. So you don't have to go through trying to find an attorney at the last minute. Does that involve having a retainer or just on goodwill essentially? <laughs> So every attorney is different. Um, so some attorneys do charge. So some attorneys, you can pick up the phone, call them, have a 10 minute conversation with them about how, you know, something goes and they're going to charge you per hour for that time. Other attorneys, um, which is what I do, I am a flat rate attorney, so I don't charge hourly. Um, so if you come to me with a certain service and we have that business relationship, um, you know, within that service. So it's not, but each attorney is different and it just depends on how you have that relationship um, and kind of that ongoing relationship. But some people, you know, they do every month, they pay me a certain fee and it within that fee, it includes, you know, phone calls, emails, being able to guide them on different processes. Um, attorneys are going to charge you per hour, do general counsel. Uh, it just depends on what you prefer and just find that attorney that kind of fits within those parameters for you. And of all the platforms you work with, which one would you say is the biggest pain in the ass? <laughs> um, I, there's two. And so I would, it's Amazon and Shopify. I'm so shocked Amazon's on the list. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, Amazon and Shopify. Um, and it's, so both are, I mean, they're great platforms. They're wonderful for people to get up and going on. Um, each of them have their own difficulties and differences, but um, I like the places where I have somebody I can talk with on the phone. <laughs> and those two are left with a general email that we'll get back to in a couple months, unless you have to find some random phone number that goes to some person. Uh, it's, I, I would rather talk with somebody than. Yeah, and Danielle, you know, there's, there's a link between the last two questions and it really comes down to advocacy. You know, you, you're talking about how, what you like and don't like and things like that. You, you're truly an advocate for your clients um, and, and it's tough, tougher to find advocates for your clients within those uh, venues. True. <laughs> I have a question for you. I know that you, I know that you build business structures like LLCs and S corps for companies, and some of those uh, types of entities require quarterly minute filings. Do you also handle that? Yes. Yeah, so I do uh, corporate books, and so I work with companies on making sure that their corporate books are up as well as when they need to hold their meetings, if they're supposed to hold their meetings. Um, and what they need to include within their meetings. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially for S corps, awesome. that, um, a lot of requirements to maintain that corporation. Sure, status. sure. I know. So if any, I was going to say I know we're probably winding down on time, but uh, just one area I've heard a lot of talk about um, as far as law and uh, e-commerce companies is. ADA compliance of websites. So for anybody who operates an independent site, um, I know that there's been, you know, a crazy number of lawsuits recently for sites that are not ADA compliant. I can tell you're smiling, so I'm glad. I think you probably know about that. It's definitely <laughs> something of interest, uh, you know, to me, so. Yeah, it's a money maker for attorneys because um, the ADA has statutory damages. And uh, it was a big thing here in Arizona. Uh, three, four years ago, there was a lot that made millions of dollars um, because all they have to do is, you know, have that complaint. And now I think uh, with most of the websites, they um, have plugins now, which I think has helped make a lot of sites now ADA compliant. Um, but yeah, that was a big thing. And people aren't top of it. So if they don't have those alt image texts, or the uh, to ring 
read the background. Um, I haven't seen much of that lately now that there's those plugins that help um, on that back end. And so that's usually what, if people do come to me after their site is built and I can tell, so the first thing I do, um, most people have screen readers on, if you guys know that, but your computer has a screen reader. Um, so you can go in there and have it read to you. And if you um, have it with that, um, then I would just talk to your web host or if you're on your own website, just to make sure you have that plugin installed, um, which kind of does that work for you. And I think they're free now. At least the one I have is free. Yeah. So who is actually, so, I mean, these are just lawyers that bring the loss. Like, do they have to show that they are disabled and encountered some issue or is it truly they are reap the benefits of finding these sites and suing the companies? Is that just... So the lawyers that we had here that were doing it in Arizona, um, they would find the violation first and then find a plaintiff. So they would, um, so it started with the brick and mortar locations and they would see like one of the um, handicap signs wasn't at the right height. And so they would just sit out there and wait until somebody actually pulled up. And so then they kind of did that. They got in trouble by the Supreme Court. And so then they moved to the online realm um, and they would just sit there and kind of wait to see when a plaintiff would come along. Um, I think they were using Reddit or something along those lines like, hey, has anybody been to this site? Um, and did you experience issues? And then, oh, now we have a plaintiff. Now we can send a lot of times it was just sending a demand letter um, and the company would pay. And when you're getting 30% off of $1,000 and you're doing 10 of those a day, um, it's, it was money making for attorneys to do that. You know, and people wonder why there's so many jokes about attorneys. <laughs> By the way, do you know how many there are? Two, I the don't. rest are true stories. <laughs> Sorry. All, right, all right. I'm done. We had to throw in there. <laughs> well, I, I wrote a, I wrote a bunch of them for the episode, but decided not to, uh, you know. <laughs> we want to throw you away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So really interesting, though, ADA compliant websites. I guess the days of, you know, with all these laws and um, if you want to process payments on your website, there's just a ton of legalities surrounding that, as there should be. Uh, but like in the pioneering days, uh, kind of when Brendan and I started off in e-commerce, you could have like your nephew that was in eighth grade build the website and you'd still do okay. But really the, this business, this industry has matured a great deal and the laws while behind the times have matured along with it. So I think anyone that's not ADA compliant and has all their T's crossed, I's dotted, you just have to nowadays, there's just a ton of liability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially with so e-commerce sellers, um, one of the things, so speaking of like their own personal websites, if they have those, is to make sure that you have not only your terms of service for the United States, but because you are online, um, the most strictest is the EU um, GDRP, would have to be in compliance with, with your online. And again, there's plugins for that. Um, so just making sure that you know, you're doing those, your due diligence, because you don't want the EU coming after you for those little things. They really are, you know, in the theme of it, little things, those little, you know, your privacy policy at the bottom of your website, right. most people read it, uh, but you have to have it there. For Return policy is another thing that people get crazy about. Mm hmm Especially if it has like, oh, we have no returns, and then you read their terms of service, and it's um, mixed messages which gets right. a lot of people into issues. For sure. Well, if anyone wants your services, how can they get a hold of you, Danielle? Yeah, so you can either call, so say two, three, one, five. The easiest way is usually to just go online to trogdenlawgroup.com um, and there's that contact us page there. Awesome. And we'll make sure to put that in the comments so anyone who's interested can directly contact you. Can you repeat the phone number one more time because you were breaking up? Oh, yeah. 602-341-6353. Awesome. Well, do anyone else have any questions for our awesome guest? No, oh, I think you did a great job. And so basically what you're saying is if people want to sell stuff online and not deal with the lawyery stuff, you can handle most of that for them. Yes. Got it. 
Great summary. <laughs> awesome. All right, well, thank you for coming on. We really appreciate it. Um, I'll let everyone go around the room real fast and plug themselves, even though I know you just did, Danielle. Uh, Brendan, you can go. Sure, I'm uh, Brendan Fields, owner of uh, Rebid. We're an Amazon e-commerce-based uh, launch platform. Dan? Dan Trumbull, dantrumbullconsulting.com, uh, Amazon Consulting, e-commerce consulting, business structure consulting. Check me out there for a free 30-minute appointment. I'm McLean Warren with Please on Marketing. Um, we're kind of an all-purpose marketing company that focuses on Amazon sellers. So anything from PPC to photography to listing optimizations. So hit any of us up. You've got a, quite a broad spectrum of experts here that can all help you with your business. So thanks everyone for watching and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye.